Hello and welcome to Ecology Live, a new series of online talks from the British Ecological Society. I'm Catherine Hill, Director of Publishing for the BES. For those of you who don't know, the British Ecological Society is the biggest scientific society for ecologists in Europe, with a membership of over 6,000 in around 125 countries around the world. We're broadcasting these talks free of charge during the coronavirus lockdown period, so that there's still a great opportunity to hear about the latest research from top speakers, even while we're all working from home. We've had over 1,500 registrations for this event, so we're really excited to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us. I'll shortly hand over to our first speaker, uh, the president of the British Ecological Society, Jane Memmott, who's giving today's seminar. But just first, let me quickly explain, there'll be a short question and answer, answer session at the end of this talk. You can submit your questions throughout the talk using the Q&A box, so there's no need to wait until the end. We'll then pick a couple of questions to ask our speaker at the end of this session. We're also recording the talk and we'll post the video to YouTube afterwards. Right, without waiting any longer, let me introduce today's speaker, Jane Memmott, and she'll be speaking about pollinators, their ecology and conservation. So Jane, over to you. Right, uh, one moment, let me just get set up. Share screen. Da, da. Right, um, it's lovely to be here in the uh, comfort of my own lounge. So I'm going to be talking about pollinators, their ecology and conservation. Uh, what I'll do over the next 25 minutes or so is tell you a little bit about how I came to work on pollinators, what got me hooked, and then I'll tell you about three projects that kind of capture the, the flavour of what we do here in Bristol. There'll be some early work on restoring pollinators, um, the first project on urban pollinators, looking at an, early, an alien plant living in urban habitats, Himalayan balsam, and the effect that has on pollinators, and then I'll tell you about the Urban Pollinators Project, which is the, the biggest and most ambitious project that, uh, that I've been involved in. And I'll end by telling you about the, the new project on the, in, in the group, which is looking at pollinators and people, and in particular looking at the dietary micronutrients from the crops that the pollinators pollinate. So, starting off with how I came to work on pollinators. This is the paper that got me hooked. Um, this is a paper back in 1996. I'd been in Bristol literally just a few months and it was in the old days when you, when you went into the library, the old paper copies were on the, on the shelves with the new topics um, there at the, uh, you know, there on view. And the cover article in this particular copy of uh, Ecology had a picture of a pollinator on the front and I picked it up and this is the paper that inspired me to be a pollination biologist. I've been interested in pollinators but I'd never actually worked on them. So it's a paper by Nick Vassar and, uh, and colleagues called Generalization in Pollination Systems and Why It Matters. And, and the, the backdrop is that up until this point, people were very interested in specialization in pollination systems. And this paper very much makes the point that it's generalization is the rule in, in pollination systems. And what's really needed are kind of networks of interactions um, uh, done for this, this particular, for, for pollination systems. And I just finished working on food webs in the tropics and thought, well, I could do that. And it, it, it was, it's a wonderful paper, it really is. It's, it's, it's cited over a thousand times, so it inspired a lot of people. On the back of that paper, I wrote this paper. Um, it's an ideas paper in uh, ecology letters, when ecology letters had just started up, and it, it produces a quantitative plant pollinator visitation network. Um, I got a little grant from the BES, which was my, my first grant um, as, as, as a lecturer at Bristol. And it allowed me to hire a field assistant for the summer to gather the data um, to put this paper together. And it's on the back of this paper that pretty much all of the work we've done subsequently has been based. So it, it, was, a, it was a really fun project to do. So moving on to the, um, the three main um, topics, I want to tell you first of all about some work on restoration of pollinators, because this is a topic we've come back to again and again. Um, this is work done by two early PhD students, Mikhail Thorup and Kate Henson, accompanied there by the, the late great Bella, a family dog at the time. 
Um, and it was working on Dorset heathland. Now, a quarter of European heath is found in Britain. Um, but 80% of Dorset heathland have been lost to, to forestry, which is what you can see in the background there, to building and so on. And what we were interested in doing was looking at restoration of the ecological interactions on, the, on heathlands and, and on restored heathlands and focusing in on pollinator communities. And in fact, it's a little bit wider than pollinator communities because as well as doing pollinators, we did the things that eat pollinators. So the parasites, pathogens and parasitoids in the system as well. So this is kind of a, a snapshot of the sort of data we're gathering. It's a, a, a tritrophic web. At the bottom, you've got the flowering plants. So on heathlands, you've not got many common plants, actually. You've got heather and erica and, and ulex. Um, in the middle, you've got your pollinators. I've just got the bumblebees showing there, but we looked at the whole community, all the hoverflies and non surfid diptera and beetles and so on. And then at the top, you've got the things that feed on the, uh, the bumblebees. And bumblebees are amazing. I remember Kate saying when she was dissecting bumblebees that each bumblebee was like a Christmas present. You never quite knew what was going to be inside. And, and oh, well, on the outside, you've got all sorts of mites. And on the inside, you've got microparasites and uh, parasitoids like canopids, which is the big maggot in the middle. Truly amazing and brilliant um, set of, of organisms to work on. So what we had, we had these plant pollinator networks from six ancient sites and six restored sites. And we had data 11 years after restoration from commercial forestry. And what we found was that, that the plant community is restored. The interactions with pollinators are restored. The same key pollinators are back. But what was interesting was only eight of the nine species of parasite, parasitoid and pathogen were there. And the one that was missing were the canopid flies, which are shown in the picture here. Um, these, are, these are amazing critters. The adult canopid flies grab a bumblebee, wrestle it to the ground and lay an egg on it. And then the larvae develops inside the, inside the bumblebee, eating it from the inside out. Um, but what's really interesting is these, these, the, the, this top level of the food web, the, uh, the, the, the parasitoids in this case, are the last to arrive. And they're a bit like the, the kind of cherry on the cake of the restoration process. And because they're the last, we actually suggest that they're particularly good as indicators of restoration success. So this work was published in the um, Journal of Applied Ecology and also in, uh, in Ecology. So moving on to the, um, the urban aliens, looking at Himalayan balsam. This is my absolute favorite alien plant in the UK. This is work done by another PhD student, uh, Martha lopez arez Mikel, and another fairly early project. But it's one that kind of again set the scene. The, the Heathland project was the first project I did to have replicate, lots of replicate networks. And this one was the first to use a big field experiment. And while field experiments are risky, you know, we've had experiments eaten by cows and run over by tractors, pretty much every bad thing that can happen to an experiment has happened to one of ours. But they're also one of the, the best ways to actually really get to grips with what's going on. So this is Martha standing in a patch of balsam. Balsam's been here since about the 1830s and is one of the top, top 20 weeds. And this, this is the paper that inspired this project. This is a, a nature paper by Lars Chitka and somebody Shurkins. And what they showed was using a three species system. So they've got balsam, they've got a native plant, marsh woundwort, and they've got uh, pollinators uh, linking the two plants. And they showed that the balsam indirectly affects the, it reduces the visitation and the seed set of the balsam, doing that by basically appropriating the shared pollinators. Balsam has 10 times more nectar than any native plant. So the pollinators go there. And what Martha wanted to do was to actually test the community-wide level effect of balsam. So rather than keying in on, on one plant, she wanted to look at the whole community. And so she had replicate networks, and she ran a big field experiment. And this is what her experiment looked like. <clears throat> she had four control plots. These are just in Bristol. We only had money to get around by bike on this project, so it was all within cycling distance of the department. Four control plots of balsam, and then four experimental plots where the experimental treatment was to remove the balsam flower heads every single week. So Martha and a field assistant went into these plots with a pair of scissors and removed all of the flowers. So our raw data are eight networks of interactions within this experiment. And underneath that kind of canopy of balsam is an understory of, of native plants, just about hanging on in there and still flowering. So what she found is when balsam's present, when you're looking at all the species in these networks, 
you've got a greater pollinator abundance, you've got more pollinator species, you've got more visits from the pollinators. And in fact, the results were the opposite to the original nature paper, and that's because we're looking at the community-wide effect here. And it leaves you with this question of whether balsam is a, a friend or a foe. Is it good for pollinators or not? Looking at those results, it seems to be quite good, but, but the plot thickens. So the next stage was to get a couple of um, amazing final year project students involved, Rick Hayes and Martin Wally. And what they did was they looked at the swabs were taken from all of the insects that Martha had caught. We'd taken the pollen off the insects and they counted the number of Himalayan balsam grains on those insects. They counted a huge number of pollen grains, so three quarters of a million pollen grains. And what was amazing was at the end of this, they, they were still smiling at the end of this. And what they found was that 95% of the balsam on the insects in the plots with the Himalayan balsam still in it and still in flower was balsam pollen. So these insects are slathered in balsam pollen. 95% of the pollen grains were balsam rather than native plants. And our thought at the time was that the seed set of natives could actually be reduced by stigma clogging. So even though we've got a higher level of visitation, we could end up with a, a reduced level of seed set because of stigma clogging. So we, we, we published this work and, and Rick and Martin came on as, as co-authors. But since then, we've done another project, so published something in 2015. And we actually now know that stigma clogging doesn't happen. And, and the next project is going to be working out why that's the case, because it's beyond me why when the insects are covered in 95% you know, of the pollen on their body is balsam, and they're, they're silver with pollen, it's not transferring to the native stigmas. So that's, that's, it's still fascinating, this plant, after the yeah, best part of 15 years. So moving on to, um, to, the, to the biggest project, to the Urban Pollinators Project. This, is a, this was a consortium project run between four universities, so Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh. Uh, so myself in Bristol, Simon Potts in uh, Reading, Bill Coonan in Leeds and uh, Graham Stone in Edinburgh. And right from the very beginning of this project, we had conservation practitioners involved. They were written into the original proposal. Um, and they're the people that buy nature reserves, manage nature reserves, and so on. So, so they can do a suite of things that academics can't do. And then we had a team of, of brilliant taxonomists at the National Museum of Wales, so that we could get all of our insects identified right down to, to Latin binomials. And this was part of the, the Insect Pollinator Initiative. So nine of these large consortium projects were, were funded, looking at the various woes that affect pollinators um, in, in the UK. We had three questions we were asking. We're asking where exactly is the pollinator biodiversity in the UK? Is it in urban habitats, farmlands or nature reserves? And this was the first systematic study to ask that. There's lots of projects in these individual habitats, but this is the first time they'd been compared systematically. And then the second question was, if you beam in on individual cities, where are pollinators in those cities? Cities are a matrix of all sorts of different types of habitats. And then the third question was what we can do, what can we do to improve pollinator biodiversity and abundance in urban habitats? And, and the aim was to do this in a really well replicated way where we look at all of the habitats in, in cities, not just say the good habitats. We look at everything that was in a city and we look at all of the pollinators and their interactions with the plants. So starting off with the, uh, the, the first question, and that this is the amazing team of people that actually did all the uh, the field work and gathered the data and, uh, and, and made the project work. So it was headed up by uh, Kath Baldock um, and then Anna Scott was the uh, queen of the GIS. So there was some industrial strength mapping needed in this project. And then there was a whole team of people, each based in uh, one of them based in each of the four universities and equipped with two field assistants. So we had eight field assistants each year. And then the final part was the, uh, we had a modeler, a young physicist called Philip Stanienko. And actually physicists can do the sorts of models that us ecologists can only dream about. So that's the team. And moving on to this first question, where are the pollinators in the UK? What we did was we sampled 12 cities, 12 farms and 12 nature reserves. And we did this right across the UK. So we did it from um, Dundee to Southampton to Cardiff. So scattered across the UK. And in each each site, each of those 36 sites, we had a one kilometre square plot that was gathered using, which was selected using this industrial strength GIS according to a whole suite of rules. And then that plot was very systematically sampled where all the habitats in each plot were sampled according to their overall abundance. 
And then picking out just one result. There's a lot of work, uh, results on this particular part of the project. But the, the, the key result, the most interesting result to me, was that there's significantly more bee species in cities than in the surrounding farmland. So cities can be really rather good for pollinators. Um, the alternative explanation is the farmland is completely hopeless for pollinators. But, but cities overall come, come out of this looking rather good. So there's this and a whole bunch of other results in our proceedings of the uh, Royal Society paper. Then the next stage is asking where are the hotspots of pollinator biodiversity in cities. So cities are, I say, this, this, this matrix of all sorts of different habitats. And we wanted to know where the pollinators were in each city. So this is what a, a bit of Bristol looks like. This is a fairly typical city. You've got a mixture of gardens, parks, road verges, cemeteries and churchyards, urban nature reserves, and allotments or community gardens. You've then got a, a kind of a hold or category called other green space, which is all of the things that aren't listed on the top. So they're all the odds and sods of you know, a bit of green grass outside a housing association um, area or something like that. And there's a surprising number of those. We've got man-made surfaces, all those concreted bits. We've got railways and roads and pavements and water bodies. And we looked at every single one of these habitats well replicated in four cities. Uh, actually with three exceptions, take that back. The three habitats we didn't look at were water bodies. There's no aquatic pollinators, so no need to sample those. And then roads and railways, we didn't look at either, simply because of health and safety considerations. You simply cannot sample at the middle of roads or railway embankments but they're a minuscule part of each city's area. All those other habitats we looked at. So looking at the, um, the, the, the sampling protocols, we were working in Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh. And again, a very systematic sampling protocol uh, where we've got replicate habitats in replicate parts of each city. We found 390 uh, flower visitors, 641 plant taxa, again, counted a huge number of floral units. And our raw data are 360 local plant pollinator networks. OK, so 90 networks per city is what the raw data looks like. And you can just see some of the everyday scenes of life on the Urban Pollinators Project down below. Well, then these are the sorts of results that are coming in. This, this is showing the mean abundance across the, um, four, uh, the, the different types of um, the nine different habitat uh, land uses um, in the four cities. The four cities are color coded. Red blue, uh, red, blue, green, and yellow. And if you go across the bottom, you've got the number of pollinators in allotments, gardens, cemeteries, nature reserves, parks, other green space, road verges, pavements, and man-made surfaces. And, and as expected, there's a lot of pollinators in gardens. We already knew that. We did not expect to see quite as many allotments. Um, allotments tend not to be, they, they haven't really been on people's radar. They're seen as a vaguely agricultural, not very interesting habitat, but they're extraordinarily good for pollinators. And then in the figure below, um, that actually shows you the proportion of each land use in each city. And the interesting thing here is, first of all, how, how consistent they are. These are four rather different cities in some ways, but in each city, there are a quarter to a third gardens. Um, allotments are less than 1% of each city. And there's a large amount of this other green space. Okay. So what you can do with those two sets of data is do some kind of opportunity mapping for where conservation would be most useful in cities. And let me explain how we do that. So opportunity mapping for conservation measures. If you take the data from those two previous figures, the pollinator abundance per meter squared in each of those land uses, and then the area of land use in each city, so the, the actual area in square kilometers rather than the proportion area, that tells you where the pollinators are found in each city if you multiply them together. And it's most easily explained by using this figure. So if you look at allotments, if you remember there were a lot of pollinators per meter squared in allotment, but it's a tiny area of each city. Um, and there's, there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's a small area with lots of cities, so it actually contributes rather little, but it's got the potential to expand. If we had more allotments, we'd have possibly more pollinators and a lot of happy people as well. So there's always waiting lists for allotments. Um, the, um, if you look at gardens though, you've got a large area and lots of pollinators. So most pollinators in cities are in gardens, but they could be even better. There's an awful lot of decking and artificial turf and kind of mown lawns in, in gardens, so we could make them much better. And then the opportunities, though, are really in the parks and other green spaces. There you've got a large area, but very few pollinators. So there's huge potential for improvement there. 
Right, moving on to the last question, what we can do to improve pollinator biodiversity and abundance in urban habitats. So we wanted to make cities better for pollinators and you've got two choices. You can increase the quantity or the quality of habitats. Okay, so you can make something good, make much more of it, or you can make poor habitats much better. And we're gonna do that in a modeling scenario and our response variable, and this is the thing that makes this work rather different to anything else, is rather than having abundance of pollinators or species richness as the response variable, we're going to have city-wide robustness. So robustness is an emergent property you get from food webs, which is to do with how, uh, how the networks respond to species loss. Do they kind of collapse really quickly or are they quite robust to species loss? So our raw data here are these networks, and that's what allows us to look at things like robustness and we've got 90 networks per city. And the reason for looking at robustness is it's robustness to species losses is increasingly recognized as an important goal in restoration ecology because it buys you some protection against perturbations in the environment. So I'm only gonna tell you about quantity, but let's just have a look. If you take each of those nine different land uses and increase them one by one in the model, which, one has the, which ones have the, the biggest effect on the robustness of the whole city? Um, in, in those four cities we're looking at. And actually the, the, the surprising result here is it was that allotments have a really disproportionate positive effect on robustness. And you need to remember that allotments are less than 1% of each city. So it's a tiny proportion of the city with this huge leverage in our models at least, we haven't tested this in the field yet, but in the models, the allotments have a, a, a hugely disproportionate positive effect on robustness. Gardens have a big effect too, but we'd expect that given their large area. So what you've got here is potentially a win for pollinators, because pollinators love allotments, a win for people, just look at the smiles on those, those people's faces. There's good evidence that people, which have, people who have allotments, are, they, they have higher levels of well-being and lower levels of stress and so on. And it's also a win for sustainability, um, because you know, it means you're not buying your peas from halfway around the world and things. So a win-win-win situation there, potentially. And this work, there's, they say there's a lot more to this work, but this came out last year in, uh, in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. Right, moving on just to the, the, the last couple of minutes, um, what I'm doing right now, the, the big new project on the, on, on the block as it was. And this one's about pollinators and people and dietary micronutrients, which is a brand new field for me. So this is the, the backdrop to this. This is another paper which I accidentally stumbled across. Uh, it's accidentally because it's in the Lancet and I don't often read the Lancet. Um, in fact, someone had to point it out to me, I didn't find it by myself. But this paper published in 2015 looks at the effect of decreases in animal pollinators on human nutrition and global health. And it's a, a large scale modeling analysis. And what the authors of, of, of this, this, this work did, and these are people from Harvard and Tufts University in the States, is they quantified the impact of pollinator declines on the production of 224 crops in 154 countries, okay? So it's, it's, it's a large scale project. And what they found was that declines in pollinators could cause significant global health issues. And it wasn't so much a loss of calories where people are starving, rather it's the loss of these micronutrients and vitamins from insect pollinated crops. And, and rather unfortunately, the, in, in the developing world, um, people are more dependent on these insect pollinated crops for their micronutrients and vitamins. And this is known as the hidden hunger. Um, and, and as an example of this, vitamin A, you get some of the vitamin A, in, or a chunk of the vitamin A in your diet comes from insect pollinated crops. And vitamin A deficiency is a leading cause of childhood blindness in the developing world. And you get your vitamin A in part from insect pollinated crops like pumpkins and mangoes and so on. So pollinators really can help you see in the dark is the bottom line here. But back, I spent a lot of last spring and early summer writing a pre-proposal and then a full proposal to work on the relationship between pollinators, this hidden hunger to do with micronutrients and climate change. And this is what we're gonna do. We're starting off with people's diets, okay? So that we're gonna do, uh, field work is in Nepal. Pumpkin and potato curry is, is, is a popular dish in, in Nepal. So we're looking at the insect pollinated crops in that diet, the pumpkin in that case, and the micronutrients in those crops. We're in the, going to the field to look at who's pollinating the crops that are contributing the micronutrients in the diet. 
We're putting together networks of interactions. This is one I prepared earlier, as it was showing strawberry pollinators in, the, in Somerset, local to here. But if you've got these networks of interactions, we've done some work in the past where you change the phenology of all the plants and look at the knock-on effects on the pollinators. So we can model the effect of climate change on the whole community. <clears throat> because as well as looking at the pollinators when they're pollinating the crops, we'll look at all the native plants that they visit as well. And what we want to do is to model how climate change affects the pollinators, affects crop production, and then the micronutrient intake of uh, the people that are dependent on those crops. And then the final part of the package is a pollinator awareness package. And one of our long-term aims is to come up with a, a national pollinator strategy for, for the, for, not to come up with it, to help the, the, the pollination people out there work on a national pollinator strategy. So this is where we'll be. We're in a, a district called Jumla in uh, Nepal. We've got 10 villages that we're going to be working in. So we'll have 10 sets, 10 replicate sites with these networks and all the dietary information. The project is literally just two months old. It started in February. Um, field work is not happening till next year for the obvious reasons um, that it's very difficult to do field work this year. Um, but it's, it's a project I'm really rather excited about it. And, and the team of people involved, this is the team of people that are put together. This is a transdisciplinary project where a bunch of people come together from different disciplines to solve a common problem. So we've got a bunch of pollination people from, uh, from Bristol University, and from one of the universities in Kathmandu. We've got a whole suite of, of nutrient and micronutritionists on board. We've got the two, the, the, uh, the two authors that top and tailed the, uh, the Lancet paper working on the micronutrients. We've got an NGO that works on the, the practice of nutrition. We've got some people from Britain that actually have 20 years experience of working on, on large scale field projects in Nepal, one of whom's developed a smartphone app um, to record diet in the field. And then the final part of the team are the climate change modelers at, uh, in Helsinki. So watch this space. It's the project I'm, I'm super excited about at the moment, and it's just starting off. So in summary, uh, what I've done is I've told you a little bit about how I, how I became a pollination biologist. It's kept me extremely happy and just interested for, for 20 odd years now. It's, it's an amazing topic to work on. I've told you a little bit about projects that are restoring pollinators, um, the first of the, the urban projects, the Himalayan Balsam project, and then the really big project that ran um, in the group for, for a fair few years. And I've given you just a, a, a taster of the project that will be, uh, there's several projects on the go. Uh, this is the, the one that um, we're, we're talking about right now. So the Dietary Micronutrient Project. And on that, I'll thank you for listening, wherever you are. I'm in my lounge in Bristol. Um, thank you for listening. Jane, thank you so much for um, an absolutely fascinating talk um, and thank you as well for being our guinea pig for Ecology Live and well done on taking up the challenge for that. Um, it was great to hear that uh, your, one of your first grants was from the BES, so that's uh, excellent to hear and now um, ended up as president. So it's so a good kind of uh, thing for those people out there applying for BES grants to kind of know about. There's been absolutely loads of questions um, coming in. Uh, um, I'm just going to ask a couple. So um, the first one from um, James Kant and also a similar question by Susanna Calton. Um, so is the higher pollinator diversity in cities compared to farmland driven by a diversity of a uh, higher diversity of microhabitats? I don't know actually. I, I haven't got a straight answer to that. We know that there's many bad things happen in, uh, in, in farmland compared to cities. So agriculture use, intensification of farmland, there's a whole suite of things that happen there to the extent that if you're trying to look for queen bumblebees, you don't really bother looking in farmland. Um, but we didn't actually specifically look at the diversity of micro habitats. Certainly in highly simplified farmland, there are far less habitats. And I think one of the reasons that allotments are so good is that they are, there are lots of different types of habitats, even on the scale of an allotment, You've got the kind of veggie bits, you've got the, the kind of rough grass around the edge, you've got the hedgerow, you've got the trees, you've got the old sheds for nesting underneath. So that heterogeneity of habitats is almost certainly important, but we didn't unpick the, um, the, 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 the habitat heterogeneity on, on the farmland side of things. Future projects. Right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and do all farmlands have the same type of management? So e.g. with herbicides versus organic? Um, and would you expect that the farming type of practice would modify the results on the diversity of pollinators? Um, so this was a question from um, Florencia Yanelli. 
Yeah, we know that on average, organic farms tend to have a higher diversity of, of, of most of the groups that have been looked at, not all, but on average. So farming systems will certainly um, affect things. Again, we had a whole series of rules for um, choosing farmlands, but we had, I can't actually remember if we had the organic farm, then there or not, but it, it will affect them. But we had a fairly standardized set of 12 farms that we were looking at. So we weren't comparing organic farms with conventional farms or anything like that. So, um, but it, it certainly farming practice does affect farms. The way we farm, what we need to do is produce more food more sustainably. That's the mantra of the times. And that involves leaving those semi-natural bits of habitat. Little tiny areas on farms can have a hugely disproportionate effect. So hedgerows are only 5% of farm area, but awful lot of the biodiversity on, uh, on farms are in hedgerows. So there's little patches. If they go when fields get bigger, then, you know, you do lose a lot of stuff. But it is reversible, it's a positive take home there. You can put them back again, so. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, and finally, uh, from Chris Thomas, how many more books do you think you can get in your bookshelf, Jane? <laughs> Uh, we, we are actually we are planning on extending it because there's a room next door where <laughs> one of my kids refuses to go because she's worried about them falling on her. So um, <laughs> never ever have too many books. And actually, right now there are a safe place for uh, keeping us all yeah sane in these rather crazy times. Absolutely, very useful for this period. Uh, at the moment, is leading the world in really high quality natural history writing. There are some astonishingly good books out there, and so for relaxing, I read novels. And I also read some of the things like The Running Hare by John Smith Hempel or, or the book that I've really, really just enjoyed is Ben McDonald's book on rewilding, rebirding it's called. So that we are okay. leading the world in this really high quality natural history writing. So if you need a sanity saver, have a look to see what's out Great. there. Great. Well, if you have any more recommendations, um, send them across to the BES team and we can tweet about them because I'm sure people would love to hear about some more um, great natural history books to uh, read at this time. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to end it there, um, given the time, but I just want to say a huge thank you again, Jane, for um, joining us for Ecology Live and being our first inaugural speaker for this uh, series. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm very pleased it worked. Um, <laughs> it did. The technology all went well. Good. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so that brings ecology, today's Ecology Live to a close. Um, a huge thanks again to Jane for being our first speaker. Um, and next week at the same time, we'll be welcoming Professor Kai Chan from the University of British Columbia. Um, and Kai will be presenting his talk on transforming, transforming supply chains to save nature, relational values and a community of heroes. So I hope to hear that many of you can join us for that. Finally, if you enjoyed this talk and want to find out a little bit more about the BES, please do take the time to visit our website and read more about membership and becoming part of the BES community. Um, a huge thanks again to all of those of you who've joined us. We've got up to a thousand participants um, who've joined us online, so that's absolutely fantastic. And we look forward to seeing you again next Thursday. Many thanks.